Hello, and welcome to Advanced Microeconomic Theory. I'm Professor Naomi Utkoff of the United States Naval Academy, and in this video, we'll be reading an economic theory paper together. Uh, I know in our last video, I said that I would read a paper cold, and this video is coming to you not scripted at all, um, as you may be able to tell. Uh, when I was reviewing all of the newer papers, the ones that I really truly could have read having never looked at them before, uh, I realized that they were assuming a lot of background knowledge that we don't have yet. And I wanted to pick a paper that would be accessible having just started to read Gail and Shapley's um, uh, matching paper from 1962. Uh, and so we're gonna read this one. This is an efficient algorithm for the stable roommates problem um, by Robert Irving. Uh, it's from 1984 and Gale and Chapley present the deferred acceptance algorithm, which finds a stable marriage matching. And uh, Irving's going to present an algorithm uh, in a similar problem, the roommate's problem, which you can think of as sort of the one-sided uh, marriage problem. But we'll get to that when we get to that. So uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started. In our previous video, we said that we should start with the abstract and that the abstract should tell us the problem the paper solves, the solution it presents, and why the problem and its solution are important to the discipline. So we're gonna read the abstract first. First, Irving is gonna tell us about the marriage problem, which he assumes the reader is familiar with, uh, and he assumes the reader believes that it's an important problem. He's gonna give us a little background about that. Now he's gonna tell us there's a related problem, the roommate problem, essentially the one-sided version of the marriage problem, uh, but that's much harder uh, and it's not as well explored and therefore he's gonna tell us something about the roommate problem. In particular, the marriage problem is really nice because it always admits a stable matching uh, and maybe more than one, but the roommate problem is ch more challenging because it need not always admit a stable matching. Uh, but in the event that it does admit a stable matching, the solution that Irving is gonna present is an algorithm that always finds a stable match or determines that one does not exist in a particular roommate matching market. So on to the introduction, which we said last time is the author's chance to persuade you that this paper is uh, worthy of being read and you should read it. I think the introduction to this paper is really nice, which is one of the reasons that I picked it. So in the abstract, Irving said that the marriage problem was the first matching problem that got serious attention. So he's going to start by reviewing uh, Gail and Chapley's paper for us uh, and more broadly the marriage uh, literature. Here I am flipping back and forth because the paragraph breaks in the middle of the page. Uh, I'm just seeing whether I need to read any of these other cited papers, which I freely admit I have not read. Uh, but my conclusion is that he's talking about sort of the general algorithmic study of uh, the marriage problem uh, and how fast those algorithms work. And I'm not going to concern myself with uh, what those algorithms happen to be because they're not essential to understanding Irving's algorithm for the roommate's problem. So now we come to uh, the last paragraph, which is a, of the introduction, which is essentially Irving's uh, sales pitch about why you should read about the roommate problem. Uh, I think this is perhaps the weakest point of the introduction, mostly because he's uh, simply relying on the fact that uh, Donald Knuth, who is a big deal computer scientist, the father of algorithms, as he's called, uh, had written at this point something called, and I'm just going to go ahead and wreck the French, Les Mariages Stabiles, something like that. Uh, summing up sort of the state of matching algorithms and uh, collecting in one place uh, many of the problems that Knuth were, felt were both open and important. And finding an algorithm that finds a uh, stable match in a roommate problem, if such a match exists, was one of those problems. So uh, Irving is relying on you having read Knuth and uh, believing Knuth. Since this is a practice reading of a paper, we are going to get on board that train. We are going to believe that Knuth is right, and we are going to proceed with uh, Irving's examples. So now, having told us about the background of matching, Irving is now going to tell us about the roommate problem. So let's summarize this, and you can see that it took me a couple of tries to get my summary to something I liked in the margin. Uh, but basically, instead of having a set of man, men and women who pair off um, one man, one woman, uh, now you want to think of a group of people, like a bunch of uh, folks, um, an even number of folks, um, uh, who are going to pair off in roommate assignments. So you want to think about a set of female midshipmen or a set of male midshipmen, and the male midshipmen can room with other male midshipmen, uh, but they can't room with female midshipmen. So 
the set of male midshipmen is a closed set or the set of female midshipmen uh, is a closed set and they have to pair within that group. Uh, so in that sense it's one-sided whereas marriage is two-sided because you have men and women in marriage but you just have one set of people in uh, the roommate problem. Uh, and to be clear we're thinking of uh, roommates who pair off in uh, rooms that have space for two people, uh, not uh, triples or larger configurations. This is just going to be pairs. So now that uh, Irving has stated the distinction between the roommate problem and the marriage problem, uh, he comes to an example that appears in Gale and Shapley's paper when they talk briefly about the roommate problem just to say it's harder than marriage, uh, and I think appears also in Knuth's uh, summing up of sort of the state of the discipline at the time, that you can get an arrangement of preferences in a really small roommate problem, right, just four people, uh, that don't give rise to a stable match. So Irving gives that example, and before we go on, we should pause to make sure that, in fact, uh, we can find a blocking pair for any possible roommate assignment. So that's what I'm doing in the notes here. Uh, when I first read this paper, I think I did all three possible roommate assignments, um, and I've done that uh, in this video. But if I were reading this paper now and it was truly new to me, I would probably work out just one um, assignment and its blocking pair, uh, and then just assume that was true of the other two, two assignments as well, just trust the author. On the other hand, there are also preferences that give rise to multiple stable roommate pairings. So here's an example from Knuth. Uh, we could check that each of these assignments is stable, but I decided to only check one of them. Uh, so my little check appears in the margins here. So now we come to the end of the introduction, and one more time Irving's going to remind us before we get into the meat of the paper what he's doing and why. He is going to provide for us an algorithm uh, that finds in any given roommate problem either a stable assignment or determines that no such assignment exists. Uh, he's doing it because Donald Knuth suggested this as an important problem, and Knuth has a larger discussion about why it's important. Uh, for now, we are going to press the preferred by midshipmen and sometimes by their professors, I believe, button. Uh, we will believe that it's important, uh, but don't make a habit of that in any for any reason. Uh, and Irving is also going to show that this algorithm it, uh, operates in polynomial time, which for our purposes means a computer can execute it fast. And he's going to provide an execution of this uh, algorithm in Pascal, which is a programming language that I don't think anyone uses anymore, but I'm happy to be corrected about that by computer scientists or other people out there who know. So now into the meat of the paper. I had to do some puzzling back and forth here, but basically uh, what I figured out, or at least what I think is happening, is that Irving splits his algorithm into two phases. And in the first phase, he's going to figure out, his algorithm's going to figure out um, basically who um, can't be your roommate. Uh, so we're not necessarily going to come out of the first phase with uh, a roommate assignment, but we're going to come out with a list of um, who can be your roommate and conversely who can't be your roommate. And we're going to do that by having um, possible roommates propose in some order. And he's going to give us an example with six people. So we're going to do one, two, three, four, five, six. And there are going to be rules for who proposes when. So uh, you propose uh, until somebody holds your proposal and then if your proposal is rejected, uh, you get to propose again. Uh, and we keep going until everyone's holding uh, one proposal or uh, somebody has been rejected by everyone, which would be so sad. So at this point, with some rough idea of uh, how Irving's algorithm works, I decided to start reading his example. So we have the preferences up top. Uh, he just provides us a list. Um, so agent one's favorite roommate is four, followed by six, followed by two, followed by five, followed by three. Uh, he calls this a preference matrix, but there's sort of only one dimension because instead of the ordered pairs that we saw in Gale and Shapley, because this is a roommate problem, not a marriage problem. Uh, and then he executes the first phase of his algorithm. So you can see that uh, I started commenting um, how 
this example related to the description of his algorithm. And then uh, I thought, based on my initial reading, that at the end of this first phase, we would actually be holding, um, everybody would be holding one roommate, like at the end of the Gale Shapley algorithm. But actually, no, that was incorrect. Uh, each person is holding one other potential roommate, but not necessarily the same one. So this phase of the algorithm is really just phase one, uh, and we're going to uh, fix it in the next little segment. So at this point, I realized my mistake, and I figured out that I'd had the incorrect interpretation of phase one of his algorithm, that I shouldn't expect uh, to come out at the end of phase one. We should not expect to come out at the end of phase one with a tentative or permanent, for that matter, uh, roommate assignment, uh, because this is just phase one of the algorithm. So I backtracked, I erased all that stuff that you see me erasing, and I made a table on the right to show who's holding whose proposal um, to be roommates together uh, at the end of phase one. So I've gone back and corrected my uh, earlier error, which is a standard thing that one has to do when one reads a paper. And because I apparently didn't read carefully the first time to see phase one and think, oh, there's a phase two, I've made a particular note um, underlining that it says this phase of the algorithm, uh, that there's going to be another phase, that uh, we're not done yet since we have not yet arrived at a match. And now I'm just checking my understanding and seeing what comes next. And basically what comes next is he's writing pseudocode, which is sort of the computer science uh, not quite ready to program language, or at least that's how I think of it. But again, computer scientists out there, feel free to correct me because I'm basing that off of my dim, I admit, memories of a semester of data structures back in college. Now that we've gotten through phase one of the algorithm, Irving's going to use that algorithm uh, to prove uh, this lemma one, which is the really important result, or so he says, and we'll talk about why that is in a moment, uh, and a bunch of corollaries so that he can do some preference reduction at the end of this phase. Uh, so I went back and forth a couple times trying to figure out if I should really work through the proofs, but then, so which we said in our previous video is one option, but then I decided that um, for our purposes and for my purposes here, it was sufficient to just get from the example um, some agents X and Y that satisfy the condition of lemma one and then work through the proof using that example. So having worked through the example, what I determined was that lemma one and all of the corollaries are saying that Irving's phase one of his algorithm is not so much about finding out who your roommate is in a stable assignment, but rather it's about figuring out who your roommate is not. And so lemma one is the basis of all these corollaries, and then corollary 1.3 tells us how uh, preference reduction goes. So I worked through uh, corollary 1.3's application to our example, and I was gratified to realize that the first choice of each agent following preference reduction was the proposal that they were holding uh, back in Irving's example of the execution. So that work matches Irving's work. So I felt really good about that. And if your work matches the author's work, that's usually an encouraging sign. And I decided to proceed with the rest of the paper. Whoops, just kidding. Here's where I work through the application of corollary 1.3 to uh, the preferences of our agents 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. So at this point, we come to lemma 2, and I felt much better about my misinterpretation of phase 1 as leading to an at least tentative stable roommate assignment, uh, because lemma 2 sort of coincides with that intuition uh, that maybe we should get an assignment, because it says that if at the end of phase one, indeed, each agent is holding exactly uh, one offer and say agent one is holding agent six and agent six is holding agent one and say two is holding three, three is holding two, four is holding five, five is holding four, uh, 
if everybody's preference is sort of reduced to one particular agent and each agent wants the one who wants them, uh, then indeed that's our stable roommate assignment, which sort of comports with my general matching intuition. So now we come to uh, phase two of the algorithm, and I really struggled with this. Uh, I, like I said, I'm not reading this paper truly cold, but I haven't read it in a while, years at this point. Uh, and I sort of remembered that this second phase was the thing that the first time around made this paper really hard, and it is still, at least for me, the thing that makes this paper really hard. So basically, after phase one, after we've done the uh, preference reduction that we just finished up, uh, then we have to figure out how to um, deal with, in the example, agents two, three, four, and five, who still have uh, multiple uh, possible partners in a stable matching, and who, if anyone, should they be paired with. So. That's what this phase is about, and it gets into this business of uh, calculating sort of cycles within the remaining reduced preferences. And uh, I, like I said, I struggled with this, and for the purposes of this exercise, I decided to stop here. Uh, if I really needed to execute this algorithm uh, for some particular roommate problem, by all means, I would work through this in more detail, but it's fine when you're reading a paper, especially for the first or sort of first time uh, to pause at some point and say, uh, I think I've gotten the main purpose of this paper, which is that you can reduce the number of possible roommates you would have in a stable matching, uh, and then refine that list to something that truly is stable. So the second phase is really about the refinement, and I decided not to worry about it, uh, and I think the first phase is in many ways the meat of the algorithm because it shows how to determine whether there is a stable match uh, or not. Uh, and then you can find it in all of its nuance uh, in the second phase, if indeed there is one. So at this point, we come to the fourth section of the paper. And at this point, we are moving away from stuff that's maybe of immediate interest to us as economists, although it might be, there is a fruitful intersection between uh, economics and computer science. But this is definitely a more computer science oriented portion of the paper. And I decided that for the purposes of uh, learning the economic stuff, this algorithm, um, I was really willing to trust the author to say, yes, this works, this algorithm goes fast, um, and provide some uh, real world, here's how fast it's executed, um, using his uh, implementation in Pascal. All right, that's it. Thanks so much for reading Irving's paper with me. At the end of the paper, of course, we have references. These are all excellent papers, uh, although I've only read the first and uh, third ones, and I've only sort of struggled through the third one because it's in French. There is an English translation out there, but I struggled through part of the French before I realized that there was an English version out there. Uh, any one of these papers, uh, with the exception of the Gale and Shapley paper, since we're reading it together, would make uh, probably a really excellent project paper, uh, and we could talk about it together if you're interested. Take care. Bye.